Please turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 17. promised you we would pick up the pace. I'm about to break that promise. Again. <laughs> I had a plan. I had a plan. Oh, I'm so glad to be here today. I'm so just excited to open God's Word. What a blessing it is just to have this, this written record of everything that He wants us to know. I mean, do, do you take that for granted? Are you, are you overwhelmed today by the fact that the, the God that spoke the world into existence also spoke into existence this document whereby we could know Him, we could know of Him, we could get close to Him, we could know what He expects from us, and, and we could be overwhelmed by Him. So we can sing songs like this this morning and just put joy in our hearts. What a glorious thing that is. Praise God. Proverbs 17, verse 1. Better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. Amen. Words mean stuff. Words mean stuff. In the original language, this word quietness, it means ease or tranquility. A time of tranquility. Feasting, this word specifically refers not just to having a big meal where there would be a lot of people there. It, it does mean that. But specifically, this one has a connotation of worship. So this would have been a, a, a meal of the the meat that had been sacrificed at the altar. You know, some of the sacrifices, um, the, the meat that wasn't used specifically and burnt to God for, for his pleasure was given to the priests, and that was part of their sustenance. Some of the, the offerings and the sacrifices were meant to be, you know what, this is going to be like a meal between um, you and I, God. And so I'm going to offer it up on the altar so that you can bless it all, and we're going to burn some of that to you, and we're going to take the rest of it back home, and we're going to have this feast. We're going to gather together. We're going to enjoy this. It's going to be like commune with you. It's going to be like we're having a meal with you, God. And that's specifically what this word refers to. So really what it's saying here, that better is a dry morsel with tranquility than a house full of feasting, this worship. It's supposed to be worship with strife. Because once you mix strife with something that's supposed to be joyous and full of worship and, and something glorious, you have problems. What's the point for us? Gather together for fellowship and for worship and for study of the Word like we've done this morning. Break bread together as Christian brothers and sisters. Yes, we're, we're exhorted to do that. But if you do those things, make sure your focus is on Jesus. During that, make sure that, that, that you're focusing on Him and the wonder of the fact that He cares for you, that He wants a relationship with you, that the one who, like I said, spoke the world into existence knows your name and cares for you. If you're going to have a time of feasting to the Lord, to gathering together, and that's a time of worship, man, let Him be the center of all of that so that everything can be glorious and joyful and comforting and, and filling and just everything positive. That kind of thing should bring ease and comfort and tranquility to everybody involved. That's part of the purpose. That's why he's provided that for us. But we're humans. And therein lies the problem. A lot of times we bring our junk into the worship setting. We, we can't sit it down for, for a minute. It's like we have to guard it. Somebody's going to steal all my bad stuff if I don't keep it with me all the time. And we bring it into the time that's supposed to be a time of tranquility and, and focused on God and, and the love that He has for us and this loving family He's provided for us. And we're supposed to be thinking about the yet. And we bring all our stuff in and it takes away that tranquility. Because if you allow anything else to rise to the forefront of your mind, especially some kind of dispute or contention or controversy, which is, that's what the word strife means in that verse. It's better to have a dry morsel with tranquility than to have a feast amongst strife. And that means disputes and controversy and arguments and negative thoughts. We'd be better off sitting at home alone eating dry toast, is what it's saying, than gathering together for the feast, for the worship, and having those other things on our mind. You ever been in a church where the disputes and the disagreements between humans is the main course of the supposed sacrificial feast? been there done that it's not a pleasant place to be it's very awkward you show up somewhere wanting to hear the word wanting to uh, sing praises to your god wanting to um, fellowship with other like-minded believers who also want to sing praises to god and and when you look around you see people kind of snaring at each other like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that 
man, it's very awkward. It's very uncomfortable. It, it should not be. There's just no place for that in, in the worship service. I was in two back-to-back church blow-ups that drove me away from the church altogether. Some of you have a story like that. A lot of you left church altogether, not because of God, but because of people. And thankfully, you came back and you saw there's a different way to do it. And may we always choose to do it differently because the enemy is there trying to stir up this strife in the middle of our feast. Always. That's what he does. I was at one church where the pastor who led me to Christ was there and he, I told you the story, he died on me and went away. And we brought another guy in and he was this fiery, red-headed ex-marine from Alabama and... <laughs> Man, it was a, he was as far from the other guy as you could get. And it was exciting. He, he, he was like, man, a line up behind me. We're going to run through walls. I'm like, yeah, let's try that. I've never done that before. Let's run through walls. Okay. Problem was, he turned out to be a jerk. He was just aggressive and self-centered. And it was all about him. And he didn't care about his people. He saw them as a means to an end. He was trying to get somewhere. That's what he cared about. And so, what do we do in the Bible Belt? Half of us left. That's what you do. I couldn't stay there anymore. I went to him. I did what the Bible tried to say to do. I went to him. I said, hey, I got these problems. I see issues here. He made it quite clear that he owed nobody any, uh, uh, any, what's the word? Explanation or, or, or anything. Certainly owed nobody an apology that he was doing what he was gonna do. I was like, okay. See ya. Deuces. <laughs> Gotta go. So I went to another church, and it turned out to be a glorious thing. I, I, I didn't get close to the pastor there. He was, he was a little too CBN-ish for, for my taste. He had a really nice suit, and it was a, they had just built a really nice building, and they were kind of into that. But, but I went there, and I heard what I consider to be real worship for the first time in my life. The, the sweet lady that was leading the worship team out there, it was just a glorious time for me, learning what worship could be, what, what, learning what the, the, the words of those hymns can actually mean to your heart when you don't just sing them because that's what you sing, which that's the church I grew up in. We just, and we sang those songs to death. We killed them. I mean, we took all the life there was out of them. And so I expressed this, this intense worship for the first time in my life, and it was beautiful. And I was just getting settled in. You know, I had my guard up when I showed up. But I'm just getting settled in. You know, I'm getting a little comfortable. Start playing bass guitar on the worship team. I'm like, okay, I'm going to ease my way in. See how this goes. So I'm getting comfortable there. And she's leading worship. And I'm playing bass. And, and everything is cool. And then one Sunday after church, the guy gives his message. And then all of a sudden, all of these guys come up and they stand behind him. And it's all the elders of the church. There's like 10 of them. And I was like, well, this isn't going to be good. I came up and stood in a semicircle behind him after he finished teaching. And he kind of turned around and looked at him like, okay. And he moved out of the way. And one of them stood up and said, we just want you guys to know this will be Pastor so-and-so's last Sunday here. We have seen some improprieties in his leadership here and some things that have caused us concern. And we are asking him to leave. I was like, you know what? If this is what church is, I'm done. I don't need church left that day I didn't go back I didn't even take my gear with me I left my guitar and my amp and my stuff there and I just walked away never went back and got it didn't go to church for for quite a while after that darkest time of my life I tell you all the time I am the most optimistic guy you know but I that was a horrible time but I felt like I'd experienced such a bright light and then total darkness That's what happens when you bring strife into the feast. You have to be careful of those things. We have to guard it. We have something special here. We have an opportunity to fellowship with one another and worship our God and study His Word and feel His love and allow the Spirit to move in us and do amazing things. We have to guard that. That's precious. A lot of people like me grew up not even knowing that was what church was supposed to be. We just got together and heard a guy tell everybody they were going to hell once a week. And 
guard this. Deal with your strife. I'm not saying ignore it. Deal with it. But deal with it in a healthy way. Find out what the Bible says as to how to deal with those things. And don't bring it in to the worship service. Make sure you can focus on Jesus while you're here. That's what we need. Verse 2. A wise servant will rule over a son who causes shame and will share an inheritance among the brothers. Now, this is one of those verses you can stretch this into a gospel reference if you'd care to without mangling it. It fits in the context of the Gentiles receiving Christ ahead of the nation of Israel who rejected him. The bloodline sons and daughters kind of getting pushed to the side for a minute. We have been adopted into the family. We have become full heirs simply by becoming servants of the Most High. So that's real. That's, that's not illogical. It's not improper. But I think the literal rending is plenty powerful uh, by itself. Just read what it says. What it's saying is, you know what? As a worker... No matter what your context is, at your job or in your home or whatever circumstance you find yourself in, as a follower of Christ, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, and great work ethic. Something people don't see anymore. If you will just be faithful in your work and do it as though you're glad to be there, or at least that you don't hate to be there, and if you will just do what is asked, if you, if you start work when you clock in, and you stop work before you clock out, and you don't take your breaks too long, you don't steal stuff from the desks, and you don't take advantage, you will stick out to whoever is above you in that scenario because it just doesn't happen much anymore. Especially if you're in what is considered a lowly position, like a servant in the context of this verse. People who do that, that the job nobody else wants to do, the one that people look down on and, and kind of take advantage of, if you do that with joy and happiness and respect and, and as though you are working for the Lord, which is what the Bible tells us to do, that's generally rewarded with respect and honor and opportunities for other positions. Not always. But we don't do it for the outcome. We do it because that's what we're told to do. Thank you. Look at Joseph's story in the Bible. It's the perfect example of this. He's the favorite son, right? He's sold into slavery by his jealous brothers. He, he's given a, a high servant position in Egypt. They saw something in him. He ends up in the household of a, an important man. I'm sure that's a way better job than some of the servant jobs in that scenario. Because he was faithful. He had a good work ethic. He did the job. He should not have been a slave in Egypt. He could have just balked at the entire thing and they could have just killed him and gone on with their life and they wouldn't have missed him and nobody else would have either. But he said, you know what? I'm still here. I'm still breathing. I have no idea what's going on. I don't know what my purpose is. I certainly don't belong here, but I'm going to do this job as though God asked me to do this job. And he got recognized. And he got a little higher position. He did the best job he could, even for a pagan master. There's a lesson for us. Your boss may not be a Christian. But if you signed on to that job and you're accepting the money, do the job. Even for this pagan master, he did a great job. He had a great work, et work ethic. He still ends up in the dungeon. His story always ends up with him going the wrong direction up to this point. But what happens when he gets there? Still has the same attitude. He still serves God faithfully, whatever that meant, in the dungeon. He still had the trust and respect of the other guys down there who were in prison as well. He eventually gets the opportunity to be of assistance to Pharaoh. He does that job as well as possible. And then he becomes the second most powerful man in the world. Second only to Pharaoh. And he does that above all of the favored sons of Egypt. This is a Jewish slave boy. And he becomes second only to Pharaoh in the world for power and honor and respect and glory. Because that's where God wanted him all along. Now he had no idea that's what God was doing. His brothers certainly had no idea that's what God was doing even though he told them about their dreams, which is what got him in trouble in the first place. 
I saw you bowing down to me. Oh, really? <laughs> Check out this hole. <laughs> Look way down in there. Let me show you something. He didn't know how the story was going to end. I bet he doubted those dreams. Sitting there in the dungeon, after having been the favored servant, and he ends up in, in prison, I'm sure he was like, man, I wonder what those dreams were all about. But he stayed faithful. He stayed gentle. His heart was soft. He stayed kind. He stayed, he stayed true to who he was as a son of God. And so God was able to take him and put him where he wanted him all along because he didn't do anything to disrupt God's process. And that is a lesson for us today. You may not be where you want to be. You may not be certainly where you think you belong. You may not have the position you think you deserve. You may not have the husband or wife you think you deserve. You may not have the kids you think you deserve. You may be totally discontented with everything in your life. Well, here's the question. Are you going to follow God or not? There's nothing in the word that says, follow him and give him honor and praise him. He's worthy of your, of your adoration and the meditations of your heart if you get what you want. What he usually does is elevate those who can praise him in the horrific situations of life. Paul hanging in a prison singing hymns at midnight. That's who he's looking for. People who know that God loves them, even if the world hates them, even if the circumstances uh, seem to be oppressing them. He's looking for those that can praise him right then and there. Verse 3. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. Now, in the old days when refining gold and silver, uh, it was done completely manually. I'm sure there are machines for all that now. I didn't look into it, but there's machines for everything else. There's even machines for my job now. There's a little village somewhere. I heard this on the radio yesterday. There's a little village somewhere, and, and they can't seem to attract clergy to come there because it's a tiny little place, and they're kind of out of the way, so they had a robot built that you can go to this robot and put an offering in and he'll give you a blessing. <laughs> I'm going to see about getting one. I mean, what could... <laughs> but in the old days, absolutely, this refining of gold and silver was done manually. They would, they would take it and, and heat it to to the, the state they would maybe become a, a, a liquid. And at that point, all the impurities rise to the top. It's kind of like if you mix water and oil together, they literally separate. No matter how much you shake it up, if you leave it alone for a little bit, they separate into two distinct things. Same thing with the impurities in the gold and the silver. You heat it and make it a liquid, the impurities rise to the top. That's called dross. And then you can just scoop it out and throw it away. You can take the useless stuff and get rid of it. That's, that's refining it. That's making it more pure. And so you do that time after time after time and it gets more and more and more pure. And they knew that they were done when they could look into the pot and see the reflection back like a mirror. That's when the impurities are gone. See, it's hazy and everything when the impurities are in there. But when it's clear and it's like glass, that's when the job is done. Likewise, God will do the same thing with us until he can look into us and see his reflection. And it can be a painful process. Refining is not terribly pleasant. Ask Joseph, ask Moses, ask Job. Area by area in our life, our language, our thoughts, our convictions, our things that we give honor and glory to, our desires, our actions. All of those things that need to be brought into submission to him will be refined. It's just what happens if you're going to follow Jesus. It's just part of the deal. Going through a process that separates the sinful things from us so they can be taken away and thrown away until he can look into us and see himself. 
That has to be the goal. That's his goal. And we might as well get in line with his goal. Some of us have learned that lesson before. In 1 Peter, it says, in this, talking about salvation, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter explains it very well here. Hey, you've got salvation. You've got hope of life eternal with the Father, reconciled to a holy God forever and ever in His presence in heaven. That is the finish line. That's where we're going. But we're still here. In preparation for that time, He's going to refine us. He's going to sanctify us. We're going to go through this process of being tested and being heated to boiling so that the impurities can rise to the top so they can be identified and seen and dealt with. Swept away. And that's going to happen over and over and over to praise, honor, and bring glory to the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's a purpose behind it all. It seems like it doesn't have a purpose a lot of times when we're in the middle of it. How can this possibly be helping? I promise it is. He's very trustworthy in this. Our favorite verse from James my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Have you lost your mind? Or where I come from, is you crazy? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Words mean stuff. Read, I've read that a million times. I've never done the word study. I did the word study to prepare for this lesson. And patience is used twice, and it's two different words. What? Yep. Two completely different words that both got translated patience. The first one, um, uh, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, that word means a remaining behind, a steadfastness, that which is left behind after the dross is removed. So knowing that the testing of your faith produces purity. Okay? A taking away of the junk. But let patience have its perfect work. That patience means circumstances, conditions. It's very odd that it gets translated patience. I don't really understand why it would. The original word means circumstances, conditions, experiences. So there is a purpose for all of the difficult things you're going through i promise the word proclaims it i believe it i have full faith in the fact that knowing that the testing of your faith produces a separation of the junk from the good so you can get away from the junk and that i need to let my circumstances my conditions and my experiences have their perfect work because they are doing something. They are purifying me. They are purifying you. They are changing you. Which is what God is so good at. The true follower of Christ will go through trials. We have to. Don't be surprised. Don't be unnerved. Don't be scared. Don't be worried. It's a natural part of the process. The true follower of Christ will go through trials, and some of them will be intense, very difficult to endure. But remember this, dear son or daughter of the living God, he is only trying to get rid of the impurities, the things that are destructive to us. He's not taking away anything that we want to keep. In our small understanding, we may think we want to hang on to some of that stuff, and God is saying, oh, you just don't know. Let me get rid of that. Please let me take that away. It's hurting you. It's slowing you down. It's holding you up. It's keeping you from running your race. It's a distraction to you. It's harmful to you. It's taking away your shine. It's making you hazy. I want you to be brilliant and shiny and glorious. I want people to see my reflection in you. 
And so we need to get rid of all of these things. Remembering that that is how you become able to count it all joy is by knowing what's going on. And that's also how you become able to embrace the process and decide to see it through as quickly as possible instead of just trying to get away from it. That's what we spend most of our time doing wrong. Trying to get away from the difficult situation. Instead of looking to God and saying, okay, what are you trying to do? I hate this. Can we get on with this? I'm I'm ready. I am clocked in. I am ready to go. Let's deal with this. Whatever you're doing, I want to do it because I want this to be over with. What we do most of the time is, i got to get away from that. And maybe he leads us to another process. And maybe we like that one a little better. Maybe we do that one. But this one still has to be dealt with. It's still an impurity that has to be separated from us. And so we're only putting off the inevitable when we do that. We need to embrace the process. It's better to just face it head on and let him be about his business. Let patience, circumstances, situations, let those difficult circumstances have their perfect work. Why? So that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's the purpose. That's what he's trying to do. Let him. Verse 4. An evildoer gives heed to false lips. A liar listens eagerly to a spiteful tongue. Ever wonder why so many really smart people are completely taken in by ridiculous lies that make no sense whatsoever? Happens all the time. And if you get into the evolution creation debate and go watch the people yelling and screaming back and forth at each other, what you end up seeing are really, really smart people that believe ridiculous things that have no basis in reality. And it's very... Uh, unnerving to watch because you're like this is so obvious to me how can you not see that there's nothing in the fossil record that proves what you want to believe how can you not see how crazy it is to believe in a process that even you say you still can't explain how it started i believe this all came from an explosion what exploded nothing what (laughs) and what was it exactly that made nothing explode Uh, we don't know yet no kidding They believe that. And this explains why. Remember last week's message where we looked at the the fact that men can have whatever plans and goals and and all that that we want. We can set any process in motion that we want, but it's God who decides how that's going to end up. These are people that have started a process of, of scientific discovery and they're trying to get to this this first fact that's what they're chasing what's the very first fact that there is to know that's where they're trying to get and yet God is saying I'm the first fact you're not going to accept that so here believe this silliness say this stuff out loud see I think he's doing that on purpose so that people would be like man what I just said doesn't make any sense you know how I'm always telling you to say your stuff out loud Because it's way easier to convince yourself of something silly when it's just in your head. But when you say it out loud, sometimes even you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I think that's what he's doing for these people. I think he's putting them in indefensible positions. So that they will say things that they can't possibly not look back on and go, that sounds kind of silly. There must be something else that I'm missing. See, I think he's just trying to drive people to him through that. I think he's trying to use that to soften their heart so that they can feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit so that they can be saved. It's not his will that any would perish. He doesn't want destruction for evolutionists. He wants salvation for them. Now, another point here. Notice how it takes a liar and a listener for the cycle to progress. Kind of a small side point. May not you may just gloss over that. Sometimes we participate in stuff just by letting people say lies and we don't call them on it. But sometimes it's maybe it's not our business, whatever. You know, pray about it. Let the spirit lead you. 
But sometimes we participate in the process by being part of it, even if we're just listening. Nodding our head. Yeah, okay, whatever. When can this be over? If you're married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> kidding. <laughs> kidding. I would, never, I would never do such a thing. <laughs> again. <laughs> I, will, I will never do that again. <laughs> Moving on. Verse 5. Here's the reason we watched that video this morning, that Chris Rice song. Verse 5. He who mocks the poor reproaches his maker. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. These are strong words in the original language. Reproaches means defies, despises, taunts. Substitute that word in there. He who mocks the poor taunts his maker. You better take a step back on that one. Newsflash, other people don't have to justify themselves to you or me or anybody else. Of course you would say, sitting here, you agree with that. Of course they don't have to justify themselves to me. I'm no better than anybody. We know that sitting here. We know that in our mind. But when you encounter somebody asking for help, do you go through the checklist of possible reasons they don't deserve your help? Because that's in contradiction to what we just said. Well, they've made bad choices. Let's put them there. Yeah, they're just lazy. They're not trying. Uh, they're, they're a scam artist. Listen, there is a time when God would say, don't help somebody. Absolutely. Heard a teaching recently where it talked about the, the, the prodigal son and how the, the, you know, we all are familiar with the part of the process where he's eating pig slop. And that's when he, it says he came to himself and realized he'd be better off as a slave in his dad's house and he goes home. Hallelujah, fantastic. What we skip is the part before it where it said he realized he had no help. And he came to himself. And he went back where he was supposed to be. And the, the person giving that lesson said, what if there had been a great Christian organization there saying, oh, look at the poor young Jewish boy eating pigs. Like, we should feed him. We should take him in. He said then he would still be there separated from his father because the process wouldn't have been allowed to complete its perfect work and produce patience so there is a time when god would say i'm doing something don't mess with this i'm doing something but the problem is we want all of those situations to be that because we don't really want to do anything the problem there is we try to decide who should get help and who shouldn't this has to be a matter of prayer. This has to be led by the Holy Spirit because we do not have the capacity to see the bigger picture of what's going on. Lord, what would you have me do in this situation? It's that simple. And then just do it. Are we only supposed to help those who deserve help? What if, what if we feel like God's telling us to help, but we're like, oh, come on, really? Really? Are we only supposed to help those who deserve help? Are we only supposed to show love and compassion and generosity and grace to those who show no outward sign of impurity? Because that's going to be a short list. That's a list we could accomplish. And that's the way we tend to want to do it. Here's the question, the real question. Does God hold us to that standard in His dealings with us? Does He wait for us to be impure of thought and action and plan and motive before he steps in and helps us. Never. Because it never happens. Praise the Lord. In Romans chapter 5 it says, but God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We're so quick to want the details of a poor person's situation before we offer any kind of help at all. Show me the verse. I'm convicted over this. Because I consider myself a very logical person. 
I feel like I read people pretty well. And I do. A lot of times I know when somebody is scamming me, and yet you might still see me give somebody like that some money or some food or something. Give them a ride somewhere, something. Because I don't feel like any more, I don't feel any more like they need to meet some criteria for me to step down off my high horse and help them. Why do I feel that way? Because I have realized what God has done for me. I know exactly who I was when he reached down and saved me. I didn't deserve nothing. I had impure motives and thoughts and actions. Nothing but impurity. And he said, I want to help that one. Why would I not do that for somebody else? So, show me the verse that says there's any kind of criteria for us to use to decide whether we should help. Now, if God says don't help, hey, absolutely, you better not help because you're not helping. But is there any verse that says that we should run through this checklist before we decide whether to help? Show me if you find that. What do the verses actually say? Acts 20, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that He said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Hebrews chapter 13, Therefore by Him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. But do not forget to do good and share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. In 1 John, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Ouch. See, I feel like I've been there. I feel like I've been that guy. It would be helpful to remember the lyrics to that Chris Rice song from the video earlier. You see, you had no choice which day you would be born or the color of your skin, or even what planet you'd be on. Would your mind be strong? Would your eyes be blue or brown? Whether daddy would be rich, or whether mother even stuck around at all. We haven't determined hardly anything of our circumstance. Even since we have been here making decisions. And yet we judge others. Because they haven't attained our level Wow. The message of that song is the common modern proverb there, but for the grace of God go I. That could have been me. You folks that go work at the journey home, have you not heard some stories that you thought, man, I see how that happened. You sit down and listen to the stories of people in that circumstance. The people that are standing on the corner begging for money. It's so easy to drive by and not make eye contact and judge them. But you go sit and listen and talk to them. And you can usually tell the stories that are lies. Listen, yeah, of course some of them make up stories. But they're pretty easy to distinguish because they're really polished and all the details are there and it's laid out in a way that they have learned breeds giving. But when you sit down and ask somebody to tell you their story and you can see the emotion in them and they're telling a story about how there was a horrible illness and and they went bankrupt and then somebody lost a job and then the house they were renting got put up for sale and and it got sold and they couldn't live there anymore and then they couldn't get into another one and they, they then they lived in a car for a little while and then they lost the car and now they don't have anywhere to live and that stuff happens and it's real and those people they need mercy and grace and kindness and love just like we do. And that is God's creation. It says to make fun of those. Listen, I've been one who's made fun of people like that. I've got no high horse for you. It says when we make fun of somebody in that situation, we are taunting God against us. That is not a position we want to be in. So it's also self-serving to be others focused. See how God does that? Isn't that amazing? We reject uh, putting others first because we think that's bad for us. God says, okay, when you do that, that's going to be bad for you. 
Actually, I'll bless you if you'll help them. Because that's what I do. And a proverb we'll get to at some point. It's a couple of chapters. <laughs> It's a couple of chapters ahead. I, I make no promises as to when we'll get there. But it says when you, when you give to the poor like that, you're lending to God. Lending. Not even giving. Not even sacrificial. God, this is for you. Just because I love you. It says you're lending to God. Which means there will be a blessing. Is this one of those ridiculous God will give you seven times more money than you give messages? No, that's ridiculous. You can't show me a verse for that either. The blessing of God is not necessarily always financial, but I'll take the blessing, whatever it turns out to be. Because that five bucks I was holding in my pocket, I guarantee I couldn't buy that blessing for five bucks anywhere else. So just be careful with that. Guard your heart on that. The enemy wants us to, to turn on one another as humans. But these are people created in the image of God, just like everybody else. Guard your heart. Verse 6. Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children is their father. Amen. And grandbabies, they make you feel like a king. You get to be the good guy again. It's fantastic. Parents, you know that moment when you go from being the amazing person that knows everything to the idiot who knows nothing with your kids? Remember the day that switch got flipped? And you're like, well, that was nice while it lasted, but it's gone. Hang on. Just hang on. Because when the grandbabies come, you get to do that all over again. And this time, you don't ever have to tell them no. You don't have to correct them. You don't have to keep anything from them. You can give them all the candy they want. And you can be the king forever. It's glorious. It is so much better than having kids. See, what, I, what, what I'm seeing now is when I was going through all that strife with my kids, when I had to be the bad guy and say, no, and you can't do that, and here's why, and you have to get up and come to church today, all that stuff, I was lending to the Lord, and he has repaid me with grandbabies. And yours are probably great. I'm sorry they can't be the best because mine are the best. But they're all glorious. It's a beautiful thing. Verse 7. Excellent speech is not becoming to a fool, much less lying lips to a prince. A present is a precious stone in the eyes of its possessor. Wherever he turns, he prospers. He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. I want to focus on verse 9 right there because it comes down to this. It's a heart issue. We keep seeing this in Proverbs. It's a heart issue. What is our motive? What are we trying to accomplish? Reconciliation and restoration? A building up? Or judgment and oppression? Tearing down? Are we seeking love? Or are we seeking something we perceive as good for ourselves? If somebody has wronged you, do you want to forgive and move on? knowing that it's best for both of you, knowing that it's the loving thing to do, or are you like that old Garth Brooks song? She buries the hatchet, but she leaves the handle sticking out. Yeah, I forgave you, but I ain't forgot nothing. And the next time you give me some trouble, I'm going to pull that sucker out of the ground and remind you of the pain you caused me nothing godly about that there's nothing jesus like about that do you keep bringing up the old stuff that's already been dealt with if so what you're saying is i know god forgave you and forgot that thing you did but you still owe me something stop stop that is self-centered and aggressive and unloving and unkind and ungracious and unmerciful There is nothing of the fruit of the Spirit in that. Stop. Stop living in the past. Stop focusing on negative things. Stop being part of the problem. 
Stop repeating the cycle. Now, there's also another issue here. Gossiping about somebody else's transgressions. If we're not covering a matter, maybe it speaks to we're sharing it with others. Whether it had anything to do with us or not. Stop. Gossip is evil. It's rotten to the core. We come up with all kinds of reasons why we need to share. But at the heart of it is always, let me tell you how bad a mess they are. We sure are lucky to be who we are. Because they are a mess. That's as unloving and unkind as it gets. What possible good are you accomplishing by spreading somebody else's dirty laundry around? You're prejudicing other people against them. We've already learned that we're not good judges of situations anyway. We never have the whole story. Even when we think we do. Think we do. We're making it hard for others to love them like they should. Because we don't love them like we should. Don't speak gossip and don't listen to it. Because again, to do either is to participate in and support and acknowledge the process. Stop. This is a big problem in my family. My family gossips. And I had to reach a point where I would say, I don't want to hear it. not listening thankfully so far i haven't had to go la 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 <laughs> but if that's what you have to do do that why because that's a good way to make the person gossiping feel uncomfortable with what they're doing so maybe they'll think about what they're doing so maybe that'll soften their hearts so the holy spirit can get them to stop doing what they're doing you're not helping by allowing them to just Continue with that. Verse 10. Rebuke is more effective for a wise man than a hundred blows on a fool. An evil man seeks only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger will be sent against him. Let a man meet a bear robbed of her cubs rather than a fool in his folly. Amen. A word to the wise is sufficient. Verse 10 says, but a fool. And over and over, Solomon tells us, a fool is the one that rejects instruction doesn't want to be corrected, wants to figure it out on their own, wants to do it their own way. A word to the wise helps them. They take it in, they process it, they apply it, they use it, they move forward in a different direction. They're better off, you're better off, everybody's better off. But a fool will most likely continue to choose foolishness no matter what discomfort is brought on them. Sometimes when you see somebody and they're just running headlong into foolishness and things seem to be going right and you're like, why is, that, why is something not stopping them? Why is God not stopping them? Maybe they're unstoppable. Maybe God knows that I could lash them a hundred times. They would still continue to do that. As verse 12 warns, don't ever forget the destination of a fool and don't give them a chance to drag you along for the ride. Run, Forrest, run. Verse 11. An evil man seeks only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger will be sent against him. I'm coming to the realization that all manner of sin that we allow our flesh to lead us into, no matter how complex it may seem, no matter, no, no matter how many different scenarios and, and actions there are, it comes down to a simple statement. Sin, be it addiction or being unloving or not growing in holiness or what, whatever sin is in your flesh that, that tempts you and sometimes leads you astray. No matter what that is. It's simply this, rebellion against a holy God. And we just need to see it as such. We, we want to talk so much about the circumstances of the sin and what are the triggers and what helps me stay away from it and what leads me toward it. Simplify. All of those things are rebellion against a holy God. If you will stop rebelling against God, you won't do those things. We overcomplicate it. And we fail because we overcomplicate it. It is that simple. Rebellion against a holy God. And it is pure evil. An evil man seeks only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger will be sent against him. This can only bring rebuke and correction from God. Why? 
because he's a good dad. He tells us through the scriptures, you know what? A good parent corrects their kid. A, a good parent doesn't let their kid run wild and go wherever they want and make all their own decisions. Why? Because that's not good for them. They're not equipped for that. And if they won't stop sticking the fork in the light socket, they probably need a little swat on the rear end to remind them that it's painful to even try to do that so that they will stop doing it so that they won't get hurt. We know that as parents, that's perfectly logical. And yet we don't really want God to treat us that way. But that's exactly what he does. He will react to this rebellion with things that we consider cruel if he has to. He doesn't want to. But we put him in a position where he has to. Because he's much more concerned with our purity and our closeness to him, that relationship. He doesn't want division between us. He's more concerned with that than he is with our worldly comfort. And praise him for it. Believe this, he will and does provide pressure that is intended to drive us back to the path. He told Paul, boy, it's getting hard to kick against the goad, isn't it? Talking about that long stick that they used to poke an ox right behind the ear when, when he was veering off the road. They'd poke him behind his ear and push him back this way. Provide some kind of discomfort to make them come back where they're supposed to be. That's what God mercifully does for us. And it's really up to us how much that has to hurt. Because he doesn't revel in that. He doesn't want to do that. You want to do yourself a favor? You want to do yourself a favor? Ask for and appreciate the short leash. And the pincher collar. You know what a pincher collar is? <laughs> Trying to train a dog, keep him on a leash, the pincher collar has all these points on it. And you put it around her neck and it, they, it, it's just hanging there. So it doesn't provide any pressure at all. But if they pull against that leash trying to go where you don't want them to go, that puts pressure on it. All those little points grab their neck real fast and they're like, hey, hey, ho, oh, ho. Oh. That's a good thing. It keeps them from running where they don't need to be. They should appreciate that. But they don't. And neither do we. In training a dog, especially a strong-willed one, you teach them to stay close by only giving them a little bit of leash and then making it uncomfortable for them to pull against that leash. That teaches them to stay close so you can protect them, so you can commune with them so you can spend time with them so that they don't run off and get run over by a car it's all good that comes from it it reminds me of the of the psalm that we all know but we focus on the lieth and green pastures part and we kind of skip the your rod and your staff comfort me your rod and your staff comfort me that's the tool of leadership the staff that gently grabs and pulls you back but also the rod of correction that causes pain as a reminder that disobedience is not a favorable choice. It's a good thing. Ask for and appreciate the rod and the staff from your God. Do that because God only warns and instructs and corrects and tries to bring us back into the fold when we wander up to a point. He tried to lead the people. He led them out of Egypt. He took them out of bondage. And he tried to lead them into the promised land. Where the fullness of what he intended for them was. But when they got there they balked. And the most tragic verse. In that scenario. After they balked it said. And the next day they turned left. And headed out into the wilderness. Because there's a point. God leads and leads and warns and instructs. And he tells you what to expect. And he tells you what he's going to do when you get there. He tells you what he has already said is going to happen. That's a promise that you can bank on. And he's so kind and so gracious and so merciful. He tries to, to prop us up and strengthen us. And give us the ability to... to follow him no matter what and to have faith and hope in him and yet if we continue to operate by logic if we continue to want to make our own decisions we continue to just honestly just not want to be told what to do if we continue to be strong willed there's a point where he says okay if 
that's what you really want. You can have that. That's what he says to lost people. I want you in heaven with me. It's not my will that any would perish. But I'm not going to make you go there. I'm not going to force you to do anything. I'm going to apply some discomfort. I'm going to poke you with the sharp stick. Try to direct you back on the path. But if you continue to push against that sharp stick, you're going to develop a little callus there. And it's not going to hurt anymore. And you're just going to go farther off. And you know what? At that point, I'll be here if you want to come back. It's dangerous territory. Appreciate the short leash and the pincher collar. An evil man seeks only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger will be sent against him. Let's finish up in Deuteronomy today. Because this is powerful. And it speaks to this, it speaks to this exact thing. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. This is Moses' last speech, last message to the people before Joshua took over. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and and evil, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commandments, His statutes, and His judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear, and are drawn away, and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob to give them. See, that's what God tells us. I saved you out of bondage. Though, If you're a follower of Christ, your salvation is secure. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. You are out of Egypt. But the promised land, that spirit-filled, spirit-led life of the believer where, where we are anointed to do great works for God through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can choose not to enter into there. Moses says, if you continue to want to do it your way, if you continue to put other things in front of God on the list and you worship those things, he says other gods, but hey, in our context, that's money or chasing money or chasing the guy or the girl or, or the career or the fame or whatever. Whatever you would put in front of God on the list. He said, if you make something else the priority, He will not force you into the place that he has for you. So we put before you today the choice. Do you want the blessing or the curse? Life or death. Choose life that you might live. It's that simple. Don't overcomplicate this. Choose life. Well, I don't know what to do. You don't have to know what to do. God will tell you what to do. I don't even know where he wants me to go. Don't worry about it. He'll tell you where he wants you to go. I don't know anything about living that kind of sold out life. Hey, don't worry about it. Neither did Saul, who became Paul. But he was brilliant at his conversion. He didn't know what to do either. He said, Lord, what would you have me do? And Jesus led him exactly where he needed to be. And he became a mighty man of God. And people are still getting saved today because of what God did through him 2,000 years ago. Glorious what God will do through us in the promised land. Tragic that we could even think to not make the choice to go in. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your warning today. I thank you for your, your promise of correction for us when we choose to do other than what you have told us to do. Lord, I thank you for the short leash and the pincher collar today.
I've spoken with Graham a lot about this because he uses this reference a lot about the short leash. He talks about how he used to just run wild out into horrible places and never felt any conviction for that at all. And now it's very strange that as soon as an evil or impure thought pops in his head, he feels dirty and, and in danger. That's the short leash. Well, he appreciates that. And I want us all to appreciate that. Lord, thank you for your conviction of the Holy Spirit, that you're not just allowing us to run free to hopefully end up where you would like us to be. No. You have something amazing for us and experience with you and an opportunity to be a vessel of untold supernatural wonders. If we would just allow you to keep us close. If we allow you to use your rod and staff and actually appreciate that. Oh, thank you, Lord, for closing that door. Oh, thank you, Lord, that that didn't work out. That thing that I wanted. Lord, rid us of the impurities. Refine us like gold and silver. Apply whatever pressure you need to in the lives of your people today to bring those impurities to the surface so they can be identified, dealt with, thrown away. So that we can more accurately reflect your image to those around us. Lord, have your way in us. Protect us from the enemy who is already trying to snatch this message from us. Lord, we rebuke that in the name of Jesus. May the thoughts of this message guide us as we hide that in our heart this week. Bring it back to our mind every time we need it. And let us take comfort in the fact that our good, good Father, as we sing that song too, loves us enough to correct us, to lead us, to make us to lie down in, in green pastures. And if you have to use the rod and the staff, praise you, Lord, for that. Have your way. It's in Jesus' name. God's people said, love you all.